You're all 
Well, good morning. Good to have each and every one of you here, and thanks for those who are joining us online as well. And uh, we just uh, are thankful in the psalm that says, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. So it's good for us to gather here together and just to worship in spirit and truth. Well, we, as we think about some of our announcements, I just want to encourage you, we have connect groups and Sunday school right afterward. We're back to a pretty normal schedule for our kids all the way up through adults. And so we encourage you to stay for that at 1045. Then right after that, we're going to have a very brief informational meeting here in the sanctuary at 1145. Uh, to tell you a little bit about a ministry, a group of people that approached us to do Celebrate Recovery here in our building. And uh, we want to share about that with our church family and uh, let you give us some feedback about that as well. Don't forget about men's group. It's meeting by Zoom right now. And if you need information, how to connect on Thursday nights at 730, please contact the church office if you need the Zoom code and the password to get in. This coming Friday, the Chaos Junior high, senior high student ministry is going to head to Wildcat Den State Park. You're going to meet at the church here on Friday at 10 o'clock, bring food for picnic lunch, and uh, let Austin know if you plan to go so he can plan transportation accordingly. Looking in your program, there's information about texting messaging uh, service that we are trying to put together. It'll help us to uh, give you quick updates of cancellations or reschedule meetings or things like that, and so we just encourage you to sign into that if you'd like, and uh, just see the program for details. And the worship team's looking for more people to get involved this fall if you'd be interested, and so if you have the opportunity to sing or play an instrument, let Austin know. We'd be interested in uh, trying you out and uh, letting you be a part of the worship team. And uh, we saw one of our people out this week on Crow Creek Road cleaning up, and it's always good to have that happen as we're being a neighbor for our community. And it's a great opportunity to pray for your, the neighbors as well as you walk up Crow Creek Road from Valley Drive to Middle Road. So if you'd like to do that, um, it's available to do every week. And you can go in groups of two. We've got all the vests and bags and grippers and everything you need. So just uh, if you're interested, use a sign-up sheet back on the bulletin board or see Carrie for more information. And again, just to remind you, point to the, to the app we have. It's available to download, but also it just has so much good information on it to keep you up to date what's going on through the various ministries and events that are going on and through the week. Well, at this time, we're going to give Dennis Bland an opportunity. Way back, was it March you went? February. February. I can remember. February, the missions team, even before that, uh, decided to support Dennis Bland in a missions trip with Calvary Church of Muscatine. And they went to Guatemala. And so because of COVID-19, we never were able to have a report. So today's the day. Dennis is going to come and tell us about that wonderful trip that he enjoyed. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Dennis Bland, and first of all, I want to apologize for my voice this morning. I don't know if it's allergies or the fact that I just spent uh, all day yesterday celebrating our, our youngest grandson's birthday with seven other grandchildren, playing in the pool outdoors, so I don't know whether it's the allergies or the grandkids that did this to me, but anyway, please excuse my voice. Um, First of all, I just want to thank the church for, for the t their part in helping send me to Guatemala. Some of the dollars that were contributed from the medication, and I'll tell you a little bit about it as we go into this. But uh, I've been a, a, a lifelong or a longtime member of Pleasant View Church, and one of the many things that I've appreciated about the church is the uh, emphasis that we have on missions in this church. We do a great job of supporting global missionaries. And... That's one of the reasons why I've chosen to participate also on the, ministry, on the uh, missions committee here at the church. It's been a privilege to serve on that, and it also opened my eyes to a lot of things. And yet, despite the fact that I have an interest in missions, I've never been on a missions trip before. And uh, I have daughters that have gone on missions trips. In fact, I've had various opportunities. Pastor Mike used to uh, take kids to Mexico, and he asked me several times to go along, and because of business commitments and such, I never did. 
So anyway, back in uh, this winter, my daughter, our daughter Andrea said, hey, Dad, our church has taken a, a missions trip to Guatemala. My husband, Mike, Mike, my son-in-law, and, and Uncle Kevin are planning on going on that. How about you? And I'm like, what? That's not even on my radar screen. What are you talking about? And yet, you know, I got thinking about it. You know what? I've never been on a missions trip. I like adventure. I like to experience and see new things. Why not? So I threw my name in the hat and uh, talked to Pastor Bruce down at Calvary, and he said, well, you know what? If we don't have 28 church members that want to go, if there's a seat in the bus, you can go along. I got to go along, and, and so it was just a fabulous opportunity for me. And so I'm just going to run through a bunch of slides on the PowerPoint here, and hopefully I can get through this in the 10 minutes or seven minutes that I have left right now. Uh, just kind of share with you what I experienced in Guatemala. So for those of you who don't know, who don't know where Guatemala is, it's actually in Central America. It's south of Mexico and uh, between Honduras, Belize, and El Salvador. So Carrie and I winter in Florida. We were down in Florida. The team was going to be uh, busing to uh, Chicago and then flying out of Chicago here into Miami, which worked out perfectly for me because I met them in Miami. Of course, they weren't pleased to see me sitting and uh, wearing shorts in the Miami airport when they showed up with down coats and jackets and stuff that they had to wear on their trip from Chicago. But I joined the team in uh, Miami. We flew into Guatemala City. When we got into the city, we, got, uh, we were met at the curb by a chicken bus. They call these buses chicken buses down there. And what they are is school buses that are uh, used in the United States. They sell them to uh, people in uh, Guatemala who trick them out. Uh, they paint them up really cool. They put chrome on them and all that stuff. And they use them to transport groups like us and tourists. So this is our group at the airport in Guatemala City. Uh, all 28 of us lining it up. We're putting our bags and stuff on top of the bus, which was kind of a fun thing to do. We did that several times. This is our bus driver, Pablo. He looks like he's 13, he's 22, and he's phenomenal behind the wheel. We went, you, you cannot believe the switchback curvy roads we were on. It was phenomenal to see his driver. That's his dad, too, who uh, actually drove one day for us. The traffic in Guatemala City, like any large city, Guatemala City is about a million people, is crazy. It's just, it's just out of hand. You see all kinds of stuff along the way. This is a pickup truck that passed us by. I thought it was interesting. They've got all of their produce that I assume they were probably selling at a roadside market along with their transportation. This is a, a, a property that uh, we were able to stay in the first night uh, just outside of Guatemala City. Uh, it's a compound that's owned by a ministry that serves other missionaries. Their whole task is to host incoming uh, missionaries that are coming into the country. Guatemala City is, uh, as I learned later, is one of the most dangerous places in the world. Didn't understand that, but uh, I guess I should have known when I looked out our window in the upper left-hand corner and saw razor wire strewn across everything, and we had to go through a secured gate to get into this compound. But they were phenomenal hosts. Um, here's a photograph of my brother Kevin's in the middle, my son-in-law Mike. Upper right-hand corner is the first volcano I've ever seen, and it was actually uh, spouting off a little bit at the time, and then a little night scene from our view uh, top of the compound. We attended church on Sunday at, uh, at this really cool fellowship. They met, and it's kind of a kind of a storefront kind of a place. Um, the gentleman on the right is one of the uh, members of the, of the worship team, or the uh, greeting team, I guess, even the greeter. And their worship was a lot like ours, except we don't have singers with tambourines dressed, decked out in cool outfits sitting, uh, standing in front. And Austin, you might want to incorporate that. I don't know. <laughs> but it was contemporary worship service. It was all in Spanish. I don't speak any Spanish, but we worshiped the Lord anyway. It was, it was pretty cool. Uh, so on our way up to Kalal, which is the village we were serving in, we stopped at, a, at Lake Atitlan. Atitlan? Yeah, Atitlan. Uh, which is the deepest lake, largest lake in Guatemala. It was about 1,000 feet deep. We got to go on a boat ride. It was surrounded by volcanoes. You see two of them in the background, surrounded by five volcanoes. Uh, and there again is my son-in-law, Mike, and I standing in the front. We went to the uh, village and got to experience all kinds of street vendors. The gal in the hat was selling what looked to me to be rotten bananas and a basket on top of her head, along with little Cupid dolls and a bunch of other stuff that you could purchase. Uh, tortillas were everywhere. As were tuk-tuks, the little vehicle on the right-hand side uh, is, a, is a, a, I guess, a motorcycle cab. Um, they were everywhere. And, of course, you could tour the city with that if you chose to do so. 
That evening, we ate at a restaurant that went through another secured gate with a security guard with a shotgun. That's the gentleman on the left with Luke from our group is standing mugging for his pose. Uh, we had a phenomenal meal, and we were ever, even entertained by a marimba band, a seven-piece band that had five marimba players, a bass player, and uh, drums, and that was pretty cool. Uh, we had some tortilla soup. We had some giant prawns. It was phenomenal. And I think Bruce was just getting us all, all ready for what was coming up next because we were going to go without a lot of this stuff over the next several days. Along the way, we, we encountered villagers that were doing their laundry in the banks of, the, of, a, of a stream, and here it's laid out drying on the right-hand side. Uh, the countryside is very rural. Uh, it's a very poor country. In fact, it's, uh, it, it's about 60% of the population is indigenous Mayans and they all live at below the poverty line. It's one of the poorest countries, well, it's actually the poorest country in Central America. So as we came into the village of Kalel, we went from hard surface roads, windy switchbacks, to gravel roads such as this one. And some of the first things we encountered in the village was this gentleman who had a horse loaded up with firewood. And uh, they used anything and everything to heat with and to uh, cook their meals. This is one of the main streets that we traveled each day up to the top of the mountain to do the job that I was assigned to do. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. Here's the gal in front of her shop. She was pretty proud of the stuff she had for sale. And look at their outfits they wore. This is their everyday streetwear. They were decked out all the time. This is an interesting photograph. They, very few automobiles and the few that are there are used for everything. This car was piled high with corn stalks that they used to heat their homes. A uh, little boy on the right uh, waving to us at a school out front. We saw poultry everywhere, and yet they didn't eat much of it, it seemed. Uh, their main diet was rice and beans. And this is the street in front of the compound that we'd be staying at for five nights. Uh, apparently, they had been doing some underground utility work that hadn't been completed, or had been completed, but the streets hadn't been put back together, so the cobblestones were in stacks everywhere, and it was a pretty rough ride. Pablo did a phenomenal job of weaving his way past these shanties, uh, getting us to where we were. In some places, I think there was an inch of clearance on either side of the bus and the roof, rooftops. This is our neighbor next door. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, there's a garage. There's a cattle barn there. There's a living quarters. This is a home that was donated to us for the week. Um, it's a gentleman's home. that He lives in the United States, but he also spends a lot of his time, I guess, in Guatemala. Um, our living quarters were such, the men's on the left, the ladies on the right. There were fewer men than ladies. We gave them the biggest room, and yet they were stacked like cordwood on <laughs> their sleeping bags on the right-hand side. We were expecting really some rough conditions and uh, maybe sleeping quarters, and yet it was, it was pretty cool. It, it, was a, it was a great setup for us. We were really blessed to be there. This is the church as it exists now. It's on top of a mountaintop at about 10,000 feet. Uh, so we, we experienced a worship service with them the first evening and got an opportunity to meet the villagers at that time. They also decided to have a groundbreaking ceremony. So we went out to the job site, and everybody had a hand with a pickaxe. And so if you can see the villager on the, light, on, on the left, that, that uh, young lady has her child uh, snuggled up on her back while she swings a pickaxe. Um, and then we had a group that had a floral um, uh, bouquet to place on, on the spot where the cornerstone, in essence, was. This is our construction crew. This is the vehicle we rode to work every day. Ten of us stacked in the back of that Toyota pickup. Uh, we were up there one day, realized that their tools were pretty junk, junky things. Uh, they had tree branches for handles, so we went to a local store, bought seven new shovels and a wheelbarrow, and went back up. This is the... the uh, this is just a little uh, rural location. There's like three homes up at the top of this, and so this is a view from the top where we would be working. This is my brother Kevin and I standing there on top of the job site. Um, we prayed every morning before we went to work, and this is our crew, our crew of Guatemalans. Uh, they are actually indigenous uh, Mayan Indians that live in this village. So we got asking, so what's this building going to look like? And they said, well, we have a drawing. There's our blueprint on the left-hand side. That's what we were given to work off of. So we, we set about to set our lines down to start building our trenches, digging our trenches. So we ran a chalk line, painted our lines, and went to work. And we had shovels and pickaxes and whatever this wicked thing I have in my hand there. And digging a 42-inch deep trenches, uh, they were 42 inches wide, 48 inches deep, through clay and rock in it. I have to tell you, I've done a lot of hard work in my life. This was probably the hardest ever. It was tough stuff. Fortunately, the temperature was only in the 60s. And uh, this is a rural view. And I think Bonner's going to give you a drone shot of this here real quick and kind of give you an uh, overview of the stuff we did. 
So uh, one of the guys brought a drone along. We got some pretty cool shots, and uh, this is just one of them. But you can kind of get an idea of the size and scope of the project. We're picking away with our shovels and pickaxes and throwing dirt. And yeah, it was interesting. And these Guatemalan guys, they're, they're small people. And yet, they do about twice as much work as the rest of us, probably because they're used to the altitude. But uh, there was one young man who would come in the morning at 6 o'clock, start to work before we got there at 8, go back to his house, change, put his uniform on for school, go to school, come back, change out of his uniform, put his work clothes on, and come join us on the work site. And we worked till 5 or 6 in the evening. They're hard working, cool. So, okay, Mono, let's go back to the... I'm going to use up my 10 minutes in a hurry here if I haven't already. So, so we were carrying rock to the top of the trenches. We, uh, we'd have to put rock at the bottom and then put the concrete on top. We were using wheelbarrows. And some of these little kids around there saw what we were doing, so they went home and they got bags and they, and they lugged back sacks of rock for us up on top. Here's the trenches as we have dug them, my brother on the right-hand side there. It's hard work, uh, and we were encouraged by the work crew to take a siesta every day. So there's Big Mike and Little Mike, my son-in-law Mike, and, and, and the guy they call Big Mike in the foreground taking the siesta. We dined with, uh, with our work crew every day, and I'll tell you that story when I have more time sometime. That's a really cool story. We had to construct all of our, um, our reinforcing iron and stuff. We had to cut on site and then uh, assemble it, and you'll see what that looks like in a little bit. Uh, the concrete work we had to carry, all the water was carried to the top of the hill, and this woman in the village carried it up in that uh, two-gallon pot on her head, made numerous trips up the top of the hill and placed it in these water tubs, these blue tubs. And then she also joined in in adding water as we mixed up the concrete. These people are hardworking people. Here you can see some of the structures in place. Uh, Anthony is placing some rock on the left-hand side. Kevin's throwing some concrete on top. And this is our work crew on the final day when we were done digging trenches and ready to go back to civilization. They were fantastic people. We bonded with them, even though they spoke Kichi Spanish, which is, a, I guess, a, a, a dialect, a Spanish dialect. Uh, we were able to communicate. We had one gentleman along from uh, Calvary who spoke uh, fluid Spanish, so that was helpful. Here's the last day as we were dedicating the site and praying that they would complete it. And we, th the two slides on the right, or photos on the right, uh, show the completion or the progress that they've made. We were a little bit fearful that they would, that the, the project might just come to a halt, and yet they've made great progress. They've got, in fact, these slides are about a month old. I would guess they're probably starting on the second story by now. Also, part of our, our uh, project was to, uh, a large part, was to provide health care for those medical treatment. And so we had a, a, a doctor, we had an uh, uh, eye doctor, we had nurses and other people who, as well as pharmacists, who provided medication, uh, checked people's vision. We had a dentist who went along also. So they provided all kinds of health care um, treatments for people. Every morning you'd have a big mob like this show up at 6 o'clock in the morning, even though we didn't open the doors till 8.30. Uh, they were there at crack of dawn, and it was cold, so they were wrapped in blankets and coats waiting for the doors to open up to be able to see the doctors and nurses. This is the school where we were able to send a team. They worked with the teachers and students to just play games and basically just love on the kids. And then Thursday night, we had a celebration as we were getting ready to depart on Friday. This was a church service that was held outdoors. And one of the interesting things about this village, I went in thinking it was going to be just, you know, as basic as it can be. Well, it had a large cell tower right in the middle of the village. And guess what? Those are all smartphones that they've got in their hands. And they're shooting video of us singing to them in a song in English. It was, it was crazy. What a wired world we are. The last day before we left, we met in the uh, school um, property and made um, balloon animals for the kids, and they loved it. You know, we had a mob lined up, and several kids went home with balloon things that they'd never seen before. In fact, they'd never seen uh, Caucasians before, most of them. We were the first Americans in their village. So after that, Bruce treated us to another little visit to Antigua, which is a super cool colonial uh, 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 town that was founded in the 16th century, and we were able to see some of the architecture there and enjoy some of the landmarks. It was, it was an amazing place to see, but quite a contrast between what we had just experienced in a village uh, that was as destitute as Kalau. Uh, the biggest memory for me are the kids, the kids and the people. They just made a profound impact on me. Just 
the joy that they had in spite of their financial uh, situation, in spite of what little they had, they were willing to share with anybody and everybody, and they did so with, glad, with gladness and, and really with joy. They were just thrilled to be able to share things with us. And so we said goodbye to our crew that we had bonded with. This is Ismail. He is running the crew who's finishing the church, and his family was just delightful. The one shower we had the entire week was in his home. He graciously opened it up to us so we could, the 15 or 10 of us, I guess, could take a shower. And so we piled in our pickup truck and uh, headed down the hill one last time and said goodbye to the villagers and uh, what a phenomenal experience it was. And so, again, just thank you so much for your support and for enabling us to be able to make an impact on the people, and it made a profound impact on me. And so if you want to talk to me about some time, there's so much more to tell, but I'm out of time. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And as we think about offering time, it just reminds me that the faithful giving of our people make that possible not just for our missionaries that we support, but anyone from our church who wants to go on these trips. We try to support at least 10% of their trip and so the cost. So when you give, you give the general fund, missions get some of that money, but also Faith Promise. That's part of the over and above that goes to missions to help make these trips possible and also just to support our normal missionaries. And this week, um, make sure you look on Wednesday on our Facebook page and the community page. I had the privilege on Friday to talk to Jeff and Barb uh, Chapman and, and uh, Don Green. So we're going to pick up some of our missionaries again and start putting them on there as well so you can get interview information from them. So let's pray for our offering this week. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people to give and that this church has been very, very supportive. About 20% of our budget goes to missions and uh, support those locally, regionally, and then around the world. And so we want to be at Acts 1-8 Church in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so we thank you that the giving that comes in, a part of that goes a significant amount to support our missionaries, encourage them to spread the good news of Christ wherever they are. And now, Lord, as we think of this offering before us this week, we thank you for the faithful giving of people. We thank you for the joy and the privilege it is to give. Thank you for generosity and the privilege to give. And we pray you'll just take these offerings and bless them and use them to further your kingdom. We just pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's continue in our worship and stand together. Should we'll blow. 
always be enough Nothing compares to your i 
make sound Only I then in Him be found Dressed in His righteousness alone Faultless to stand before
may be seated. Well, I usually say kids are dismissed at this time, but not yet. So we're going to be doing that in a few weeks. But I encourage you to take out your Bible. Thank you, Josh. And turn over to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, the fall from grace by man. I don't know why, but God has prompted me to spend a lot of time praying about this passage this week. And I know it's a very familiar passage to all of us in many ways, but this passage talks about the original sin and uh, all the ramifications we'll talk about next week, the consequences, the fallout from it. We'll see some of that, but we're going to look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, and I encourage you to follow along as I read from the English Standard Version. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat? Of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6 So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, And it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And may God add his blessing at the reading of his word this morning. Well, John Davis, who writes Paradise to Prison, one of the commentaries I'm reading As I go through this, it says it would be a marvelous indeed if the same could be said of man throughout history that was said in the beginning. He, man, was not ashamed. But unfortunately, as we'll see today, uh, the actions of Adam and Eve changed everything for this world and the consequences and ramifications of their decision to eat the fruit affect us to this very moment. I'm convinced that you cannot understand the rest of the Bible unless you understand Genesis 3. Yes, we've looked at Genesis 1 and 2, and those are important, but you begin to see the formation of the doctrines that are essential that go throughout the rest of the Bible. If you didn't understand the fall of grace by man, his original sin, and redemption, how do we understand the rest of the Bible when it talks about redeeming man to himself? Some say Genesis is not history at all. 
And Genesis 3, Genesis 3, for many people, is just a good moral story. Some liberal theologians say that the serpent is merely a symbol in a story, like a fable or fairy tale, of evil. God can make a serpent talk. That's, we know that through scripture. If you read later on, we know that he made a donkey talk. We know in the New Testament that demons spoke through human voices. And so while this seems unusual, we see other instances where this has occurred. Satan is referred to in the New Testament book of Revelation as the serpent of old. So he was called a serpent in Genesis. He's called that in Revelation, the last book of the Bible. It says in Revelation 12, 9, and the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Just like we see or about to see in this passage is that Satan is a liar. He's the author of lies. And Jesus pointed that out when he was confronting the religious leaders, the Pharisees, in John chapter 8, verse 44. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He is the originator of lying. And so at this time, in Genesis chapter 3, just so we understand, Lucifer, who became Satan, was the highest, the most beautiful archangel that God had created. Some say that he was the worship leader of heaven. He was high up there in his ranking. And then you turn over to Isaiah chapter 14, in 12, verses 12 through 14, we see the five I wills that Satan had pride built up in his heart, that he wanted to dethrone God and take him off and take control of it. And because of that, God cast Lucifer out with his fallen angels out of heaven, and he became known as Satan. And we know that as he continues on, that he will be God's arch enemy until we get to the book of Revelation, where he'll be cast into the lake of fire with the rest of those that have turned and disobeyed God, and that will be his fate for eternity. So we get a little background about who Satan is as we look at Genesis chapter 3. And I just want to encourage you and let you know that we had planned in the spring, but now moved to the fall, we're going to show a movie here called Genesis is History. Del Tackett from the Truth Project, he goes on a journey to find evidence of Moses being the writer and also the historical record of the Bible being true. And just as a side note, I don't know if you've heard recently that there is this controversy in Jerusalem as to whether they really use doves or not to sacrifice. And in an archaeological dig not too long ago, they found tons and tons of bones of doves around the Temple Mount where the temple was. Again, over and over, archaeology and other things remind us that the Bible is the word of God. Well, as we see today, we look at where sin originated and from this point on has passed down to every human being who ever lived and ever will live except for one person and his name is Jesus Christ. He was 100% God, 100% man, but he did not have a sinful nature because he was not born of a human father, but the seed of the Holy Spirit. He is the only exception. So everyone is born has this sinful nature. First thing you see on your outline is the deception that leads to sin. The deception that leads to sin. In Genesis 3, verse 1, Now the serpent, was more, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Notice that Satan uses a serpent to disguise himself and to lead Eve and Adam into sin. Temptation always seems to come to us in many ways through a disguise. You know, Satan likes to wrap things up in a beautiful gold present, but his promises are empty and everything falls apart when you open up what he has disguised for us in our temptation. Just a quick note here, we see in verse 1 that word crafty. And that word crafty is a neutral term. In Proverbs 1, 4, it's used to talk about someone who is prudent in their financial affairs. But here in Genesis 3, it's used in an evil way. So Satan is using a serpent to talk with Eve. And why Eve? Why not just go right after Adam? 
Well, Eve was vulnerable because most likely she was not there when God gave the direct command to Adam to say, of all the trees you can eat of, but this one you do not. And so she didn't hear it firsthand from God, most likely. But it's implied that Adam was there along with Eve, even though Satan was addressing the woman. We know that because the you there in the passage is in the plural tense in the Hebrew. And so Satan was talking to the woman, but he knew that Adam was listening in on the conversation. Satan did not state an outright lie, but he simply rephrased what God had said to Adam on an earlier occasion. So we see the taunting of God's word. Satan taunts God's word. In Genesis 3, the second part of that verse, the serpent said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? This is one of his, uh, Satan's best ways to deceive us is to twist scripture or to misquote it or to quote it out of context or leave a portion of it out. And so we see here, that he is uh, just rephrasing what God has said and trying to uh, induce wrong motives upon God. We think about in the temptation of Matthew chapter 4 where Satan comes to Jesus and tempts him on three different occasions. In the middle one, he quotes a verse from Psalm. I think it's Psalm 95. And in there, he leaves out part of the verse. The goal is to get Jesus to come down off the pinnacle and to worship Satan and take on the role of being in charge of this world. And, of course, Jesus rebukes him because of his deception. So here he's saying, did God actually say, or another way to put it, is it really true that God said, Satan is challenging God's authority, he's challenging God's character, and God's motive for making this command. And he's implying to Eve, is God really fair in denying you the opportunity to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Remember, God gave Adam and Eve everything in the garden to eat, everything. But Satan points out to the one thing that they were not allowed to partake in. And isn't that the way Satan is, right? We, we fixate on the one thing that we can't have. We forget about all the other blessings that God has given us. Think about it. He told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Enjoy all the animals because you have dominion over them. You have full reign of this garden except for this one thing. And isn't that the way it works for us, right? We forget about the blessings that God has poured out on us. And we sometimes fixate on the thing that we don't have. So we need to be careful that we don't lose focus and to look in context from God's perspective of what he's doing in our life. When we look at Eve's response in verses 2 through 3, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Some communicators feel that Eve may have been already agreeing with the serpent, that God was not being fair to them to hold back this opportunity to eat from this particular tree. We see second of all, not only the taunting, but the twisting of God's word. The twisting of it. Look at verses 4 and 5. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In the serpent's second attempt to tempt Eve to sin, the serpent is questioning God's purpose and motive for making the command that he did. It's ironic to me that Satan's first challenge of God's doctrine is talking about God's not going to cause you to die. There's not going to be any consequence or judgment. Think about how ironic that is, because as I said, what happens at the end of the book of Revelation? He's judged all the time for the evil that he brought into this world. And so he goes right after the fact that God is not going to really do anything if you eat of this tree. The serpent counters Eve's response. If man eats of the tree, they will be equally qualified to be like God or as God is. And the serpent, again, is calling into question God's care, his grace, and his love toward man. So Satan left several impressions with his questioning for Adam and Eve. First of all, the knowledge of good and evil made God God. If you know what God knows, you will be God. 
Second of all, Adam and Eve would be capable of knowing all good and all evil perfectly, and they would be equal with him. And God doesn't want that to happen because, thirdly, God is jealous of the knowledge of good and evil and his unique place in the universe. So he was holding that tree away from them because he did not want them to be equal with him. That's what Satan was saying. And Satan's words and promises, as we said, never comes true. He deceives us. He manipulates people to do what he wants to them, but it leads to destruction and disaster. Adam and Eve would never be able to obtain all this perfect knowledge because in order to do that, they would have to disobey God's command, and that would not be a righteous thing to do. Also, it says that they would die if they obtained this knowledge through eating the fruit that was forbidden. People on their own cannot assess accurately what is good. Before we know Christ as Savior, we're tainted by sin to try to figure out what, what's good and what's evil. We have some moral ideas, but until we're saved, until we see through the lens of the Holy Spirit and God and his word, that's when we fully understand what good and evil is all about. And that's why Proverbs 4.23 is so important. It says to keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. As we think, so we become in our lives. And we need to be into the word of God to avoid the deceptive things that Satan wants to bring our way. So our application here is that we must guard our hearts from the deceptions of the world system, the deceptions of our sinful nature, (coughs) excuse me, and Satan's influence. Those three things we have to deal with on a daily basis. The world system, the sinful nature, and Satan's influence that comes at us because we're believers. Well, Eve believes the lies of the serpent and decides to disobey God willingly by eating of the fruit that was forbidden for them to eat. So second main point, we see the deliberate act of sin. The deliberate act of sin. And it's important for us to see here in Genesis 3, 6, how she, she moved through the process very quickly to jump right into sin. Look at verse 6, if you would, in Genesis 3. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, Eve took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So Adam and Eve, they were in a quest for wisdom. They were in a quest for what was good, but it was all apart from God. They wanted to do it on their terms. Instead of being dependent upon God and all his provisions and all his blessings and the joy of the relationship that they'd enjoyed up to this time, they decided they were going to venture out on their own. That in their independent, free spirit, they could be different from God and do things for themselves. And that's a dangerous place for any human being to be at. We see here in verse 6 the progression of sin and how it works in our lives in most cases. So write these three things down quickly and we'll talk about those and we'll extrapolate those temptation thought transgression temptation thought transgression 95 percent of the sin or more that we do in our lives goes through this progression begins as a thought or begins as a temptation in our minds then we dwell on that thought for a while and then eventually we act on that in our lives if we decide to sin In the King James Version, in Genesis 3, 6, it says this, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. I want you to look at that verse in the King James. You see these words, she saw... And then she looked, it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired, and then she took. She saw, she looked, she took. If you go over to Joshua chapter 7 in the King James Version, you'll see the same event occurring again. You remember that the walls of Jericho had come down and the Israelites were commanded not to take of the spoil, not to take anything and to destroy everything. It's interesting when you read in the book of Joshua how God worked in different ways. Sometimes they could take the spoils and sometimes they couldn't. But but they were commanded not to. And what did Achan do? 
he took spoils and hid them in his tent. And when he was confronted in Joshua chapter 7, verse 21, he says, When I saw among the spoils a goodly babelish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. He saw it, he coveted it, or he looked on it, he desired it, and then what did he do? He took it for himself. We see the progression of sin. If you ever take the time, we won't look there, but First Samuel chapter 11, you'll see the same three words, saw, look, took. David was up on his palace roof. He should have been out with his army. His army went out without him. And he saw Bathsheba down there bathing herself in the water, her next, his next door neighbor. And he saw her, and then he began to look after her, lust after her. And then he got one of his uh, servants to go and brought her, and he committed adultery. He saw, he looked, he took. You see that progression. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, we see the root of all sin. There's over 100 different sins listed in the Bible. But we could boil them down into three categories. In 1 John chapter 2, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. I think the next slide lays it out. Here we go. Temptation. You see the desires of the flesh in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. Saw, they look at something. Then you see thought, the desires of the eyes, look. It's a pondering. It's a thinking about it in your mind, what you would do if you were to carry out this particular act. And then the transgression, the pride of life, where you take it to be independent of God for yourself. So you see the progression all through the Bible beginning in the Garden of Eden, this way of temptation, of thought, that leads to transgression. It even goes on in James 1, 14 and 15 to say this, but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. So when you think about your life and how sin occurs, just think of that process Satan or the sinful nature or the world system brings these things into your mind. You know, as I've often said over and over, Martin Luther, we can't do anything to stop temptation. We can cast it out. Just like if a bird lands on your head, if you let it stay there, it'll build a nest or you shoo it away. We have a choice when we face temptation, what we're going to do with it. Unfortunately, in the case of Adam and Eve, they partook of the fruit In Genesis 3, 7, we see then the eyes of both Adam and Eve were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. You see immediately the conviction of sin. Their eyes were both opened. All of a sudden they realized that the innocence was gone and that they were naked. And one aspect of truth that Satan said is that eating the fruit would give them the ability to know good and evil. But again, Satan's promises are found to be empty. Adam and Eve now saw good and evil from the perspective of being a sinner, from the depths of corruption, from the ground, rock bottom, looking up. Now, like God, their natures were fixed. God is holy and man is a sinner. And they knew what good was, but now were unable to attain it. And they knew what evil was, but they could not resist it. It reminds me of what Paul said in Romans chapter 7 and verse 19, which is the predicament that all of us in this room and all those online face for themselves. It says in Romans 7, 19, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. And isn't that the battle that we face each and every day as we wake up is this battle to keep our sinful nature reined in. Adam and Eve saw their nakedness in new light. They were not innocent anymore. They were shameful and they were disgraced. They traded the radiant garments of innocence for sewn together fig leaves. It it took away their perfection and their relationship with God. And instead of finding joy and delight by walking with God, they're hiding in fear of God's judgment upon them. 
This act brought spiritual death, and now they're in need of redemption to get back to the relationship that they once had with God the Father. But God, over time, would have revealed the truth of good and evil if they simply would have waited for his timing. Now they had to learn to battle with their desires to sin and do evil. And again, you and I, we face that battle each and every day. When we wake up, we need to remind ourselves that we're in a battle, that we need to get into the word of God, whether it's in the morning or the night, but we need to get in on a consistent basis because that's how we gain God's perspective. That's how we hear from God. We need to pray. We need to pray on the armor of God as I do every day. Each piece to remind us that we are in this battle so that the fiery darts of Satan would not take us out. We need to pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit, full reign of every area of our life and sensitivity to sin, that as we go out, we can recognize when the temptation is before us. We need to look, at, look for the way of, out of temptation. It tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, there's a way of escape. And we need to pray for wisdom and victory over the temptation. We need to identify what are the circumstances and situations that lead us to fall when we're tempted. What are the levers? What are the buttons that Satan or your sinful nature it gets pushed that makes you into this particular habit of sin that you may be dealing with? But when we do sin, thankfully, 1 John 1, 9 If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the antidote for sin for us as Christians. So our application here is that we must be honest with ourselves about our pull towards sin. It's like a magnet. We're not a sinner because we were born and we sinned. We sin because we're born sinful people. That's a huge difference. And I hope you understand the difference. Many psychologists will tell you that you were born with a blank slate. And based on your education and based on your parents and all these things, it decides whether you're going to do good or evil. We sin because it's natural for us because we're born in that state of original sin. The third and major point that we have in the last one is the damage as a result of sin. The damage as a result of sin. In verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God among the trees of the garden. They hid themselves. And so we see, first of all, that sin separates us from innocence and perfection. The sin separates us from innocence and perfection. Now, many scholars believe that God walked physically in the presence with Adam and Eve. This could be a Christophany. It could be the physical form of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. But nonetheless, that word walk there doesn't mean going from point A to point B. This word here means he was meandering. He was kind of maybe walking in circles. He was pondering his path as he was going. Many uh, scholars believe, the Jewish scholars believe that at this point, that the Israelite theology, the God that they had, Yahweh, was still developing to the point of all-knowing everything. But that's not true. He knew everything. He wasn't seeking information when he was calling them out. He was asking them to come out and redeem the relationship with them. Adam and Eve had pushed their relationship with God away, and he hid, they hid among the very trees that God intended for their pleasure. They now made it a barrier in their relationship with God. And while Adam and Eve hid, marvel of all marvels, the creator God of the universe continues to pursue them and restore the broken relationship with them. This is the recurring theme of redemption throughout the Bible. Think about the prodigal son's dad waiting there with open arms for his son to come home in Luke 15. And over and over we see that picture of our God being a pursuing God As Casting Crown sings, love move first. God seeks after us. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God responds not just as a creator or just as the righteous judge to judge sin, 
but he mostly responds as a father whose children have spurned him, who he desires to redeem and have a relationship through mercy that's poured out upon us because of God's son. God sets the course here for how he wants to confront sin. Look at verses 9 and 10. But the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God said, where are you? Where are you? He wasn't seeking information, as I said. He knew exactly where Adam and Eve was. He wanted them to come out and to reveal himself and talk about their sin. I grew up in the East. When I was a young boy, we played uh, this game called Kick the Can. Anybody play Kick the Can? Okay. It was one of our favorite games. We'd go out about dusk, and we'd put a can out in the road or in the grass. And, you know, one kid would be it, and he was the protector of the can. And, you know, you, he counted, hit his eyes, and everybody ran and hid. And then he would finish his count, and he'd begin to look for somebody. And uh, pretty soon, there was nobody around. It was so quiet, so he'd venture out a little further, a little further. And if he got too far away, someone would make a run for it. And if they kicked the can before he tagged them, then he could say, Ollie, Ollie, in free, everyone come out and come home. Come out, come out, wherever you are. The game was over because... Uh, they had been freed from being tagged and be it. Well, God's coming along in the garden. He said, come out, come out from wherever you are. I want to meet with you. It's safe. I want to talk to you about what happened. And Adam responds that he hid out of fear, out of conviction of sin. One who will, and he ends up being the one who will pass down the sinful nature through all time until the new heaven and the new earth. And so it begs the question, why Adam? Didn't Eve sin first? Well, I wish we had more time to talk in depth about that, but you can look at Numbers 30 and 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and 1 Timothy chapter 2, where it talks about how God makes man the head of the of family, the head of the wife, and he is the one responsible. And why would Adam be responsible? Well, Adam had heard the good and the negative command from God directly, while well, Eve most likely did not. So Adam is without excuse. Adam also received a firsthand relationship with God's provision of love and grace, even the gift of Eve given to him. Adam gave approval to sin, to Eve's sin, by sitting there and listening to the conversation, knowing that the serpent was deceiving his wife and downplaying God's motive and plan for them. I think most importantly, the reason he is charged with the sin is that he didn't want to be different than Eve. He decided to eat of the fruit on his own will because if he didn't, that relationship between the husband and wife would have been drastically different and Eve would die and he would not. So we don't know exactly why, but for whatever reason, God placed the responsibility upon Adam. He refused to speak up to protect his wife in an opportunity when she was faced with temptation. He didn't take care of the spiritual needs of the family. Well, then we see sin separates us from the relationship with God. Question two to Adam from God in Genesis 3, verses 11 through 13. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. He said, why do you distance yourself from God? In Isaiah 59, verse 2, it says, but your iniquities, your sin have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. But isn't it interesting in the story, instead of God pouring out his judgment and anger upon him, what does he do? He shows mercy. He shows mercy. He says the question there, Question three, have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Blame shifting occurs here. Blame shifting. First, Adam blames Eve, and then he blames God. No different from our world today, right? No different sometimes what we do when we're caught in a sinful situation. Question four, God continues to use this method to bring about what happened to the full light. This time, God turns to the woman. He says, what is this that you have done? She blames the serpent for deception, and she admits to taking and eating the fruit. Back in the 70s, there was a comedian named Flip Wilson. He had a show. 
And he'd often say, the devil made me do it. Whenever something was done wrong, it was always the devil's fault. And isn't that the way it is? We like to shift the blame off on someone else. And that's what Eve and Adam did. But God was looking for a full confession from the heart that would lead to repentance. And isn't it interesting that God used the way to draw that out from them by asking questions? I find questions to be very intimidating when you do something wrong. Because when someone asks you a question, you have a choice to make. Am I going to lie or am I going to tell the truth? Sometimes it's easier to just be confronted with the truth. And so they had to be honest and they had to tell them. And even though their confession was not full, God showed grace and mercy and forgave them their sin and restored his relationship to them. God didn't have to show mercy. The couple deserved punishment and the full measure of his wrath, but God showed kindness. So what can we learn from this exchange? Well, God is loving and merciful toward us even when we sin. We can come to him at any time just as we are. No matter what condition our soul is in, he will be receptive and open to us. But we should also follow God's lead and strive to forgive those who've sinned against us, even if their apology or their confession is not fully what we would like it to be, we should forgive. One of the most convicting verses to me in all the Bibles, I've said many times, is Ephesians 4.32. It says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And here it is, as God in Christ forgave you. How can we not forgive? Because God has forgiven us so much. How can we hold bitterness and not restore relationship with someone? if God is willing to do it at any time in our lives. So here's our application. There's always a price to be paid for our sin. There's always a price to be paid for our sin. Our sin and the sins of all humankind caused God his one and only son. He took our sin and exchanged it for his righteousness. What an amazing grace. And here's our key thought. Don't allow the gifts of God's grace and mercy become an excuse to sin. Don't allow God's grace and mercy become an excuse to sin. Too many people, Christians, do that. They figure that God is merciful and gracious and I'm just going to live my life however I want because God's going to forgive me in the end. Well, we're almost out of time. I don't know how come we're so late today, but I'm just going to share a story and then we're just going to close the service and not sing a song because we're almost time for Connect Group. But as we think about this, I want to put in perspective a a story that I often tell when I share the gospel is that of a young woman, 19 years of age, who went to traffic court in California. And uh, she was convicted of speeding. She got a speeding ticket. It was excessive. It was going to be very expensive. And she showed up for court. And of course, the judge comes in. Everybody rises and they're seated. And the judge begins to read the charge. And he says to the girl, What's your plea? And she says, guilty. He takes the gavel and pounds the desk. He says, guilty is charged. Please walk over and pay the bailiff the due fine that goes with the speeding violation. But then the judge does something really unusual. He stands up and he unzips his robe and he lays it carefully on his chair. And he walks around and meets the girl next to the bailiff. And he pulls out his wallet and pays for his daughter's speeding ticket right there on the spot. He showed grace and mercy. He was a righteous judge. He had to pronounce judgment. He couldn't ignore the fact that she had violated the law. So the law is right and just. But he was willing to pay the penalty for the speeding violation. And that's what God did for us when he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And God, through this story, we see his mercy. We see his grace. We see his desire to... Uh, have that relationship with each and every one of us. And so today, if you've got an area of sin in your life that's kept you uh, away in your relationship with God or it's hindered your prayer life or whatever it is, now's the time to ask him, confess, and ask him to forgive you of your sin. Let's bow in prayer. And as we pray this morning, God knows your heart. Is he asking you a question today? Is he asking you, is everything okay in our relationship? And if he prompts you through your Holy Spirit to 
confess something and to seek forgiveness, do that. Because he is a heart that's pursuing love and relationship with each and every one of us. And we see that in the early pages of this book. Father, I don't know what's in everybody's heart today, but you do, and I pray that you would just help us to be thankful that you're a pursuing God, that your first reaction is grace and mercy and a patience to allow us to come and to confess our sin and to find forgiveness, to rebuild the relationship. Lord, I pray that if there's people today that need to do that in our room, that you would just work in their hearts and lives. Help them this week to restore and rebuild that relationship with you. Now, Lord, as we close the service and we get ready to go to our connect groups, we pray that you will just uh, help us to enjoy that time of fellowship and in your word for our kids as they go to Sunday school as well. I pray you'll bless this time and bless this time together. We pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask the usher to come and dismiss the rose. And don't forget, we have an informational meeting at 11.45. Connect group starts in about three minutes.